just keep say it, say. It ended this week's Adria, Parshas Kisete. So the, the, um, the, the, we, the, 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 the mitzvah of Schira Samolik is mentioned. Uh, it's mentioned that, uh, that it's a good idea to make sure to be in Shul in Parshas Kisete uh, in order to ensure that there won't be 12 months that one did not hear uh, Parsha Samalek, uh, the Shabbos. Okay, but in any case, the, the, uh, so the Torah tells us about how we're required to, uh, to remember what Amalek did and how Amalek surprised, attacked us from behind. And they, they, when they attacked the Jewish people, they attacked the weakest ones among the Jewish people. And the Pasuk says, Ba'ata So you were faint and exhausted and did not fear God. Now there is a dispute. What does it mean? You're, 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 you were faint and exhausted. When Amalek, when Amalek, uh, when Amalek attacked you, you were faint and exhausted when Amalek attacked you, and below Yorel Kim and did not fear God. So being faint and exhausted, obviously, it's Atta, you, the Jewish people at that time were faint and exhausted. Obviously, it wasn't Amalek. Amalek did a surprise attack. It waited for a moment that the Jewish people were faint and exhausted, tired. Tired and exhausted. But when it came, came to, but the Lo Yorel Kim did not fear God. So most of the commentators explain that the Lo Yorel Kim has reference, has reference to Amalek and not to the Jewish people. However, there is a minority of commentaries, and it has a basis in many medrashim that the Loyore El Kim has referenced the Jewish people also. That the Jewish people were tired, exhausted, worn out, and they did not fear God. But first, we'll deal with the explanation that most of the commentaries have. Most of the commentaries say, that the Jewish people were exhausted, tired, and faint. But it was Amalek who did not fear God. Now we have to understand, what does that mean? What is the connection? Now, the question is, when we say the Jewish people were ayefiyageya, tired out, tired, exhausted, faint, is it talking about a spiritual lethargy? Tired on a spiritual level? Or is it talking about being tired on a military level? Tired because of the road, because of the physical, uh, the, the, the physical action of, of traversing the desert. So if we understand it, to mean in a spiritual sense, and of course we'll have to understand what does that mean, tired and exhausted in a spiritual sense. But so the idea is, so Amalek, did not fear God. Why? Because the Jewish people were tired and exhausted spiritually. How we understand that? But the Gemara in Brachas and the Gemara in Menachas, when it talks about the tefillin shalrosh, the tefillin of the head, the, the, the Gemara tells us that the Rebbe, Rebbe Lezar Gadol said, 
when all the nations of the world will see that the name of God is identified with you, the Yarumi Mecca, then they will fear you. In other words, because probably because of uh, heavily intervention, and perhaps it's because of a, a certain respect that they might have for the Jewish people. Because we, we know the Torah tells us Ki chachmaschem udinaschem leine kol the, the nations of the world, uh, while they many of them hate the Jewish people, many of them would like to destroy the Jewish people. But they recognize the connection between the Jewish people and the Torah. And they, they, they understand. And for sometimes that causes the hatred, but they understand that the Jewish people have a special mission in life. So, when the nations of the world see that you, the name of God is called upon you, the Yarumi Mecca, they will fear you. But when we are sp when spiritually lethargic and we are not, we, we do not have the, the proper uh, enthusiasm for the, for the Torah and for the mitzvot and for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So that fear that the nations of the world should have of the Jewish people is not there. So you were tired and worn out spiritually. So, so, so then then the, the nations of the world, and specifically Amalek, did not fear, did not fear you and did not fear God. And in a sense, this was Bilaam's idea. Bilaam, Bilaam suggested to Midjan that, that, the, that they, in order to overtake the Jewish people, he said, there is no way they will be able to destroy the Jewish people because God intervenes on their behalf. And he suggested to them, the only way to do it, in a sense, to get them to leave HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to get them to sever their relationship with God. And he suggested that they use their daughters to entice the Jewish people and because of that the the the, 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 the this this would lead uh, Billam suggested to give the ability to have the Jewish people destroyed so when when there is a spiritual lethargic attitude among the Jewish people. So then the, 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 the nations of the world don't fear God because they feel that God will not intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. Now, a matter of fact, it's interesting. There's a famous story about the Vilna Goan. Story is, and uh, there are records after the fall of the Soviet Union. So many people went in to check the records of the, uh, of, of the, uh, to check the records that dated back to the time of the Vilna Goan and the prisons, I guess, in Vilna, wherever it was. And one of the prisoners listed there was Rabbi Eliyahu Chassid. Because uh, the Vilna Goen was considered a very pious individual. So people used to call him in those days, Rebbe Yohu Chassid, Rebbe Yohu, the pious one. 
So apparently the government uh, did not know the Vilna Goen's family name, whoever it is, whoever arrested him. I think his last name was uh, officially Kramer. So, so in the prison records, his name is listed as Rabbi Leo Chast. But anyway, the story is that when he was in prison there, so the guard came in to question the Vilna Goen. And at that time, the Vilna Goen was wearing talus and fillet. That was the practice of the Vilna Goen to always wear talus and fillet. And when the guard or the officer of the Russian government came in to question the Vilna Goen, he got scared and ran away. And there was another Jewish prisoner in the prison. And he asked the Vilna Goen, how is it that when you, that when you were, were, uh, were, were uh, when they came in to question you, and they saw you, they ran away. And the Vilna Goen said, it's very simple. I was wearing my tefillin. And it says, the Gemara and Brachas, all the nations of the world will see that the name of God is called upon you and they will fear you. So he's, and I'm a Rabbi Lazar Gadol. Rabbi Lazar Gadol said, Eil tefillin shabarosh. That's the tefillin of the head. So he saw, he saw me wearing the tefillin shalrosh. So he quickly ran out. So the prisoner felt, well, maybe if it worked for the Vilna Goen, it will work for me also. So the prisoner, when they came in to question him, and he had to understand in those days, when they questioned Jews, it wasn't with a lawyer present, and very often it involved torture, and a person was beaten up. So they went to question him. So he stood there with his talus and tefillin, imitating what the Vilna Goen did, and it didn't have the same impact. On the contrary, they beat him up. So afterwards, the person went to the Vilna and he says, I don't understand. When they came in to question you, so they ran out in fear. And you said, because they were wearing tefillin. Well, I was wearing tefillin also. So the way the story goes, the Vilna Goen says, it doesn't say, Eil Tefillin Sha'al Harosh. This is the Tefillin on the head that makes them fear you. But Eil Tefillin Sheb Arosh, that's part of your head. The Tefillin has to become part of your thinking, part of your lifestyle, part of your attitude. If it's just filling shalal arosh, if it's just filling on top of the head, they won't be scared. When it's a row call amayar, it's kishem vishem nikre alecha. It's not just the wearing of a particular garment or, or even a, 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 an object of dusha, but it's becoming one with that object. So we could say that perhaps that's the idea also here. If we're talking about a spiritual lethargy, so the villain is not part of the personality, is not part of the personality of the Jew. Sometimes he just barely puts it on. But if the villain comes part of the personality, then they, they fear the Jew because they fear HaKadosh Baruch. And so we could understand the Lo Yare Elokim because you are Ayavi Akeya spiritual. But 
we could understand it in a different way. And both could be true. In other words, from a perspective of military might, sometimes countries have an attitude, a tired attitude. And when a country has a tired attitude, so other countries are not scared to attack them. When they see that they're not prepared emotionally, besides militarily, but emotionally prepared to go to war, to be on constant guard. They put their guard down. They have a sleepy attitude. Their nations do not fear that country. We've seen this slightly. So, and the truth is, we see that by the Miraglim. The Miraglim said that when we came to spy Eretz Yisrael, the Miraglim who gave a report, and with that report led a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They said that the, the Canaanites were such giants that in our eyes, in comparison to them, we were like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. In other words, the perception that they had that the Canaanites had was based on our own self-perception. And when we have a tired attitude and they know that we're not ready to encounter them, when they know that they'll have an easy job. So that's the time that they attack. You were tired and worn out. So Amalek and all the enemies of the Jewish people under those circumstances is below Yore Elokim because they, they understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help the Jewish people. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help the Jewish people when the Jewish people are determined, show, have their faith in him and are ready to fight for, for Eretz Yisrael, the land that was given to them. But if they see that Klal Yisrael is not ready to fight, then they don't fear God. And in a sense, this was what Muhammad Samalek was. What was Mechemes HaMolek? The Jewish people took to battle against Amalek. But Moshe Rabbeinu had to stand on top of the mountain with his hands up in the air. It's obvious that if the Jewish people didn't go to battle and Moshe Rabbeinu had been on top of the mountain, so Klal Yisrael, would not have been successful. Moshe Rabbeinu went on top of the mountain to be mispalo, that Klal Yisrael should be successful. There were times, individual times, that even without lifting a finger, Nisim happened. But we can't, we can't rely on that situation, that that will happen, unless a Navi will tell us in other words, we have to know uh, when we go to war, this was last week's Sedra, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be there for us. We don't have to be afraid of the enemies. But we have to go to war anyway. And especially by Melchemist Mitzvah. Melchemist Mitzvah HaKol Yodzin. A 
So the Klal Yisrael has to do its part. And when Klal Yisrael does its part, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu will, will, will assure the success of Klal Yisrael. But if Klal Yisrael has a half-hearted attitude and, and it's Oyev the Ageya, and they're not really ready to go to fight, emotionally not ready, then, then the nations of the world will not be fearful of God's help. Now, and it's very interesting, I wonder, the midst of Skira Samolek, why do we have to, why we have to remember the hatred of Amolek? We have to, we have to remember what Amolek did for us in order, in a sense, for us to, to recognize that ultimately we, we will have to wage war against Amolek. But I'm wondering whether it isn't included in the midst of Schiris Amolek, of remembering what Amolek did because racist Goyim Amolek. Amolek was the first of the nations who after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, after the Exodus, when all of mankind became fearful of the Jewish people, was scared to wage war against them because they recognized the Yad Hashem, the hand of God that was associated with the Jewish people. So wh whether part of Sechiris Amalek is a mitzvah, remember Amalek set the blueprint for the nations of the world. He is the symbol of being able to wage war against the Jewish people. And because of that, we have to be on constant guard. When Amalek attacked, we weren't on constant guard. We were Oyev the Ageya. We went, we went v'chamushim alu b'nei Yisrael mimitzrayim. The Jewish people went out with all kinds of weapons. But it was just a parade. Lots of people, I call it the, uh, the cowboy approach, that they feel there's something lacking in them if they're not able to hold a gun. And I'm not talking against protection. I'm talking about the emotional need that some people have that they have to hold a gun. Because they see something is lacking in them. So the Chamushim, I think, Rav Henkin said that about the Chamushim Olu B'nei Yisrael Me'eretz Mitzrayim. I think I once saw in the name of Rav Henkin that the Jewish people went out like, like soldiers to show, to demonstrate they're ready to fight. They might have had the military equipment to fight, but they didn't have the emotional uh, makeup to fight the war. That's Oyev Yageya. That's tiredness. If you don't have the emotional makeup. Having all the military equipment among the nations of the world, even among the United States. Well, first of all, others are building up their arsenal. The United States certainly has a great arsenal. The question is, what is the emotional makeup? Are we ready to defend ourselves? Are we ready to defend our allies? Are we ready to defend Israel? Or we don't have that emotion. And I should say, and I think this is a problem that I've noticed, 
that among the Jewish people, among the Orthodox community as well, the concern about Israel is not like it used to be. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking, I'm not saying that they are, but I'm not talking about the Sakmak Sidim who probably, I'm sure they have relatives in Eretz Israel, and they're very concerned about them also. But I'm talking about those who, who, whose parents, who to a certain degree were from the same part of the community as they are. But when it came for the safety of the Jewish people in Israel, that was the number one concern that they had. And all of a sudden, that crumbled. All of a sudden, you see many among those who even identify themselves as Orthodox, they say they want, they, they, they're concerned about the Palestinians. They're not concerned when the Palestinians take a Jewish child and bang his head against the cave wall. Where, where did this attitude come from? And I know I'm deviating from what I was speaking about, but I think it's very important. My father's Zatzal was a universalist. I don't think that there is anybody who wrote from a halachic perspective the importance of treating non-Jews in the proper way, like my father. You can look in his forum, in any one of his forum. So he was a universalist. To him, a life of a human being was the most important thing. My father would get angry about the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. I remember when someone would bring it up, he would get very angry. But my father's universalism emanated from his Judaism. The problem we have today in some quarters of Orthodox Jewry is that Judaism emanates from the universalism. When Judaism emanates from universalism, then some of the Jewish people could become allies of the biggest anti-Semites. And we have to understand how foolish can you be to wonder about making a treaty with Iran? So this is, in a sense, we have to be on constant guard. Is not only to remember to, to bear a grudge against Amalek, but part of it is to be on guard. Part of it is to be on guard, not to be Oye Fiyageya. And we have to, it's not just that it's not enough that the Jewish people, that Sahal, that the, the, the Israeli army be on guard. The Jews in America have a mandate to also be on guard. Because what happens in America affects what happens in Israel. Everybody talks about the mistakes that were made during World War II. But the question is, are we repeating those mistakes? In a different sort of way, I'm not exactly equating everything. So, 
But so we have to be on constant guard, not to be Oyefiyageya. But there are those who explain that Oyefiyageya below Yari Elokim, Cheskuni explains it that way. I think he says from the Mechot it appears that way. I remember encountering two expressions and I think it was the Medrash Rabbah, I don't know, Medrashim, that Oyevyegeya below Yare Elokim is talking about Klal Yisrael, that the Jewish people did not fear God. And so there's an identification of Oyevyegeya being tired and worn out with Lo Yare Elokim. Now, what is Oyev? Oyev, they say faint or tired. Yegea is exhausted, but it's an exhaustion that comes from work. Yegea kapekti sochal ashrei v'tov lov. So actually Yegea, we even talk about Yegea v'torah. There is an emphasis on, on, on the labor of the person. The impact that the labor of the person has. Now, it's very strange that, and I think I saw this question in my uncle's name. It should have said, first you work, you gear, you work, and, and then, then you become Ayef. It's very strange that it says you're tired and you're worked out. First you work out your, your labor uh, it, it, that, that saps some of your strength. And as a result of that, you become tired. But here it says, Ayef, that you're tired first. So how we can understand it? And my, my uncle said, I think it was my uncle said, in regard to this pasuk, that when you have tiredness that comes before the agia, it's not a, a tiredness that comes from work. It's an attitude of tiredness. Why should it could manifest itself in a number of ways? Why should I bother? It's a lot easier for me not to do it. Or even worse than that, it could be a form of depression. The person who's depressed, there's a sense of I don't care. There's a sense of loneliness separated from others. Sense a feeling that there is no hope. There is a feeling, a sense that a sense of frustration and without there's no nothing that I can do about it. There's nothing that I can do about it. So when one has a, an attitude of tiredness, every time he lifts his finger, he will become much more tired. It's ayefiyageya. Now, why did Amalek come? What, what was the sin that caused Amalek to come? Now, what is the unique feature of Amalek? I think I once saw the name of Arad the Rugged Shepherd. Then Pashish Bishalach, it says, Kes Ka. Kes Chaf Samach. And then you have Ka, uh, which is part of God's name. So, Kes is part of the word Kise, chair, but throne. So the Raghachava says, really, it should be case card. It should have been one word, the throne of God. He says, Amale came 
and separated the case from the car. In other words, what was Amalek's motivating factor? Why did they why did they attack the Jewish people? Why did they come from a faraway place? The Jewish people weren't anywhere near their territory. It wasn't so much at that point because of the Jewish people, but because they saw the Jewish people as B'ni B'chori Israel. The Jewish people are going to be the ones to spread about the kingship of HaKadosh Baruch Hu throughout the world. Because of that, they wanted to destroy the Jewish people. Because they didn't want the Jewish people to have that opportunity to restore kingship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, my uncle would always say, I've mentioned it before, the Rosh Hashanah night, the Chaslavich, the town where my grandfather was rubbed, was a Lubavitch town. They used to call it coronation night. Why? Because there's a difference between a Moshel and a Melech. A Moshel is a ruler. A melech is somebody who's accepted. Somebody who is accepted as a king, who's accepted as the leader. Rosh Hashanah night, we proclaim God is not just the Moshel, God is the king. It's coronation night. Malchus is given to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Amalek wanted to separate Malchus from God. He wanted to separate the Kisei, the throne, from the car from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But and what the Jewish people, the Jewish people when they were in Rafidim, what, what did they what, what did the Jewish people do? They said, Hayesh Hashem B'Kibbenu, right before Amalek came. Is God in our midst or God is not in our midst? In other words, they, they made themselves not sensitive to the presence of God. When somebody is tired, when someone is asleep, when someone is lethargic, his, the, event, the things that are surrounding him is very dull in his consciousness. The Jewish people, the, the, the Jewish people in their Ayyafi Agaya and their attitude, yeah, sure, there was a Kriyas Yamsuf, but Kriyas Yamsuf was over. And then they had to, they had to walk in the desert. And there were times there were hardships. They didn't have water. So they said, They didn't recognize the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They made, they, they did not assert themselves to see, to, to recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu taking them out of Egypt and to realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will deal with all the problems that they will encounter in the Midbar. So therefore they said, Hayesh Hashem Be'kibbenu Imayim, is God in our midst. Non-recognition of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's an Amalekite trait. And it's because the Jewish people at that point, was said, Hayesh Hashem Be'kibbenu Imayim. So because of that, they, they, they were punished with, Am with, Amalek, with Amalek attacking them. Now, it's interesting that we find similar beforehand in Mara with the same problem. The Jewish people didn't have water. Or the water was bitter in Mara. In Rafidim, they after the incident of Rafidim, uh, the, uh, so they didn't have water. In, in Mara, the water was bitter. And they didn't drink water for three days. And the Chazal tell us 
The Dorshe Rishimo said, yes, it's true. They didn't have water. All that is true. But in Mayim El Torah, in addition to the, 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 the water that we drink, they were lacking the spiritual water. For three days, they didn't, they didn't learn Torah. And because of that, the Chachamim instituted, the Chachamim instituted Kriya Satora, that there should be a Kriya Satora, and there shouldn't be a three-day period without reading the Torah. We, have to, we read the Torah on Shabbos, we read the Torah on Monday, we read the Torah on Thursday. And it's interesting, when Moshe Rabbeinu instituted it, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't institute three temps. It was a very short Kriya Satora. Three Tzokim. And my, my uncle in the, in the Shirm Lezeh HaBamari, he mentions, why was it at that point only three psukim? Ezra came and instituted ten psukim. Your, uh, your, your regular Kriya Satara, Monday and Thursday has to be at least ten psukim, ten verses. When Moshe Rabbeinu instituted, it was just three psukim. Seems strange. And my uncle said that when Moshe Rabbeinu instituted Kriya Satara, the purpose of the Kriya Satara was not, the purpose of the Kriya Satara was not to, for the intellectual study of Torah. As significant as that is, and according to Rabchaim Balazhin, that's even Torah Lishma. But it was for the experience of Torah. Experiencing Torah. What does it mean to experience Torah? When we, when we learn Torah, when we, when we, in the morning, we say a bircha satora. What's the idea of bircha satora? The shem Hashem ekra havu gadol elokeinu. When I call out the name of God, I give greatness to our God. And the idea is that Torah itself, the mitzvah lima Torah, might be an intellectual study, but Torah has to serve also as a medium to sense the presence of God. How does one come to love God, to recognize God? The stock of the Lomo, the Sifri says. Look at the world, look at nature, but also his stock of the Taraso. You can feel a sense of closeness to God through the learning of Torah. That's the experiential element of Torah. So the idea is we have to make ourselves sensitive to the presence of God. To make yourself sensitive to the presence of God, it can't be done successfully if you have an attitude of I'm tired, I'm worn out. I'm not anything that's around me, that's close to me. There's a certain dullness. I'm not aware of everything that's taking place. Certainly when I'm sleeping. The purpose of Torah, in other words, the Jewish people, and it's interesting, the Mara says that why did they have to institute Kriya and Torah? Ain Mayim El Torah, they went three days without water, without Torah also. Nilo. Nialu. They became exhausted. That's the expression. It was a sense of tiredness. When you don't learn Torah for three days, it's not just that you didn't learn Torah. There was an interference with your ability to sense the presence of God around you. Nilu. So the, the for that, because of that, they instituted a Torah study. And it's interesting that some of the commentaries on the Rambam say that Kriya Torah was not just because of Mara, but because of what happened in Rafidim also. And that comes together with Zohar. So, so, si karam basayfim Yoshua. It was these two events that 
the people, in a sense, Rafu Yedeim and Debe Torah and Rafidim, our sages tell us they were not so involved in Torah. So, 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 see, current the safer. So here, that's the, that's the hint to the institution of Kriya Satora. It was these two events where the Jewish people were spiritually lethargic. But that was indicative of Lo Yore Elohim. They didn't, they didn't fear God. They didn't sense the presence of God. So then they had to fight the war. But Moshe Rabbeinu stood on top of the mountain with his hands in prayer. So when they saw that, they understood that even what they did, they were fighting the war, but it was only through HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence in their midst that they were able, they were able to successfully overtake Amalek. Now, the, uh, and this tiredness, this tiredness in a sense, emanated from the fact that they, there was a certain loneliness, uh, separation from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now the Rambam, when he, uh, when he says, uh, the, the Rambam in the Hilchos Tshuva, uh, the Rambam in Hilchos Tshuva says, even though, even though there is a, a mitzvah, uh, the mitzvah of shofar, it's a, it's a decree from God, and we have to blow shofar because it's a mitzvah. But Rem is yesh b'davar. There is a message, a hint. Ur yesheni mitig maschem. Wake up out of your lethargy. The shofar is an alarm clock. It tells us to get up. The shofar is also the kol shofar hafata. God made his presence known to the Jewish people. Medrash tells us, and the Zohar says it, that at the time of Matan Torah, the Jewish people got up late. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made them comfortable so they had a good sleep. Sleep. When someone is despondent, when someone, when someone is is despondent and he, he, he just can't do anything. He has a depression. So even the sleep itself doesn't really help him. Just blocks out the rest of the world. But there are times that people enjoy their sleep. There are times that people feel comfortable. But even then, we have to know how to get up. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Medrash says, took the mosquitoes out of the air, made the, the wind proper so the Jews the night before Matan Torah should be able to sleep well, have a good rest. But then when it came to Matan Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Lama basi ve'nish, karasi ve'nona. I called out and no one answered. The Jewish people were sleeping. They didn't come to Matan Torah. And Matan Torah wasn't just the getting of the Torah, as I've mentioned many times. It was sent, it was revelation, sensing the presence of God. They didn't come. There it was different than up to that point. Up to that point, their spiritual lethargy was one that wasn't even arresting. It was just blocking out the rest of the world, not able to do anything. But sometimes a person can have a real good rest. But you have to be able, and you feel very comfortable. And sometimes you have dreams. And people have all kinds of dreams. And some people don't want to deal with the real world because of their dreams. Dreams are good. Goals are good. But you can't just dream. 
you have to do something awesome. You have to be able to wake up. I remember once, I, people, I talked to people sometimes. I talked about the situation in Israel. They, and they, and they, uh, they give, give me all kinds of comments like, uh, what does Israel need an army for? Let HaKadosh Baruch Hu, let HaKadosh Baruch Hu take care of everything. And at the same time, they'll say to me, who gave them a right to give back territories? I'm against giving back territories also. But they, they don't see any contradiction between the two. They dream. To make believe Israel doesn't need to protect itself. So we have to be able not only to get out of our spiritual lethargy, that is a lethargy of one of that really doesn't offer us real rest. It's just depression, an inability to deal with the world. But at the same time, we have to be able to get out of our sleep and out of our dreams to confront the real world. So this is, and the way we confront the world is like Klal Yisrael for Amalek. It was with Moshe Rabbeinu with his hands up in the air. Yes, we're confronting the world. We're fighting on behalf of the Jewish people. We're fighting for our survival. We're fighting for the future of Klal Yisrael. What? It's to, our success is only because of our Kodesh Baruch And I want to, to, I'm going to add a statement. Maybe I shouldn't add it, but I'm going to add it anyway. We know that there's a lot of fighting between the different elements in Eretz Yisrael over the drafting of yeshiva boys. I shouldn't even say drafting yeshiva boys about yeshiva boys serving in the army and not serving in the army. I'm not going to get into that specific point right now. But at the very least, I think it's important that both sides recognize the contribution of the other side. I think the, the, I don't want to use the word hatred, but the fighting would be much less if the yeshivas would say, yes, thank you for saving our lives. And if the, and if the, uh, the, the, uh, and if the non-religious at the same time, or I shouldn't say the non-religious, those who, who serve in the army will recognize that those who are learning Torah, those who are really learning Torah, are in a sense giving the Jewish nation its Jewish identity. It's giving Israel its Jewish identity. It's linking it to the, gen to the, to the past generations. To Maimed Har Sinai. I think those who believe that they have no need for the Israeli army and they don't owe a debt of gratitude are not only wrong, but more than anybody else, they're harming themselves and their own courts. And if there is resentment, that's part of the reason, perhaps the main reason there's resentment. And at the same time, those who fight in the army have to know what they're fighting for. They're fighting for the perpetuation of the Jewish nation. And it can only be the perpetuation of the Jewish nation if it's identified with the Jewish people of past generations. 
So, we, in other words, we have to look at Melchemes Samolek. There were those that were fighting the war. By the way, Chalon Anoshim, Men says, Anoshim Tzadikim, seems being a Tzadik was not a disqualification for fighting in the war. But at the same time, we have the, there has to be recognition of the special identity that those who are sitting and learning Torah give the state of Israel. Israel declared that its right to the land of Israel is based on its historical right. We only have the historical right if we identify with the past generations. The identification with the past generations can only be through the Torah. And certainly those who do both are Mekadesh and That's what we have to, that's what we have to know. And it's, it's interesting, years ago, so the chauffeur, the idea of the chauffeur is to wake us up from our lethargy, whether it's the, the, the lethargy of, of, of the depression or it's the lethargy of having a good sleep, of dreaming, of confronting reality. The sound of the chauffeur is to make us up and to evaluate and see what we're doing and what we're not doing. And what we're recognizing and what we're not recognizing. But if you sleep, things just happen. And you're not in control of any situation, not even of yourself. And my, my father and my uncle, they mentioned a story that at one time, I think it was in Chaslavich, my, the Baal Tukeya, my, as I mentioned, my, my grandfather was the rub there. The Baal Tukeya was crying, and my grandfather got concerned that it might interfere with the chauffeur. He was a very fine person, tzaddik, but he was overcome, chauffeur! So he said to him, do you cry when you eat matzah? He said, no, and I eat matzah, I'm very happy. So my, my grandfather said, then you should be happy when you do the mitzvah shofar also. And the truth of the matter is, uh, the Rashba actually said what my grandfather said. He said, we, why do we make Shechiyana and shofar? Because through the shofar, we're going to attain a kapara uh, for our sins. Okay, but then the, the person was, uh, he knew, he knew how to learn. So he said to my grandfather, he said, but the Rambam says that the purpose of shofar is Uri Yashem Mikir Maschem. You see, wake up from your lethargy. We have to recognize that we're in a lethargy. So my, my father said, as my grandfather said to him, the Rambam says that in Hilchos Tshuva, not in Hilchos Shofar. What does that mean? In other words, the mitzvah of shofar the mitzvah of shofar is a mitzvah of blowing shofar. That was the command of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I have to have, the kavana I have to have in mind is to fulfill the mitzvah of shofar. Mitzvah strich is kavana. Certainly by shofar, there's more reason for it. But, but nevertheless, there is a message. But the, the focus of the mitzvah is not the moment you hear the shofar. But when you think about the shofar, when you study about the shofar, when you when you actually hear the shofar, I share Kiddushanu Mitzvosav, there's no, nothing more to talk about. That's the idea of Chodesh Elul. Chodesh Elul, there is no mitzvah of shofar. I once heard from my father, Chodesh Elul, the purpose of the shofar is to understand the reason of shofar. The reason of shofar that's part of Hilchus Tshuva. We have to understand what the message of shofar is. So after hearing the shofar, we will, we will in fulfilling the mitzvah of shofar, we will fulfill the mitzvah of tshuva. Elul is preparation for that Sarah made tshuva. And part of the preparation for that Sarah made tshuva 
is to understand the message of Shogar. And that's, it's in Hilchus Tshuva, because by Hilchus Tshuva, we have, part of the mitzvah of Tshuva is not just to, to ask for forgiveness when we recognize the sin. Part of Tshuva is when we come, when we come to, to, uh, uh, to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, to our Saras Yom Tshuva, to search ourselves out. And that's the message of Shofar. We learn about what the message of Shofar is during Elul and Rosh Hashanah, we fulfill the mitzvah of Shofar. Okay. Okay, everyone can put questions in the chat. Um, one question is, could you just explain again the difference between Moshe's decree about reading Torah with three psukim and Ezra's decree to read 10 psukim? Okay, uh, it's, it's some, Moshe's decree to read three psukim was just for the experience of Torah. To ex and the way I understand it, because when you, when, you, when you hear Torah, in a sense, you're experiencing God's words to you. So you experience God. It's not like reading a newspaper article, what someone said. It's actually when you're learning Torah, God is talking to you. But, but the, the, uh, the 10 psukim, 10 is used, it's considered a certain amount. 10 is a completion. So Ezra focused on the teaching of Torah, my uncle said, on the learning of Torah. And Moshe focused on the experience of Torah, experience of Torah. And I think experience of Torah means experiencing God at, at Matan Torah, because every time you learn, it's a form of Matan Torah. This question might be too big of a topic, but uh, someone did ask. Uh, you mentioned earlier about if uh, we in America have to stand up for things because what happens in America affects Israel. Is there a level of our inaction? Could that ever lead to a level of Los Amaral Damariacha? <laughs> I guess on the national level, it certainly does. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other um, uh, questions here. So everyone have a good week. Uh, Mir Tashem will be back here next week uh, at the same time, same link.